Our scripture today is Genesis 7, 1 through 5. I never know how to say that. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you alone are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and its mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and its mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the air also, male and female, to keep their kind alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. The story of the great flood is one of the oldest in all the world. We can find a version of this story in almost every culture in the world. We find a version in just about every geographic area. We find enough evidence of floods in our stories to suggest at some point there was a lot of water. We don't know when. We also don't know if the stories are all based on the same flood. What's, what's a flood in Southeast Asia might really be a snowstorm or a hot streak in Southern California. The ancient Greeks had a belief that the earth as a whole had been flooded massively multiple times throughout history. They didn't know how big the whole world was in their time, but they did know that there were shells found on mountaintops. They did know they found bones of sea creatures inland in the fields, places where sea creatures could not have swum to on their own. Surely, they assumed, much of our world at some point was covered by water. Some have suggested these stories are all unrelated, that flooding happened in different areas at different times because every culture eventually had to face the question, why does this keep happening here? Or why did this happen to us? In the Hebrew Bible, Genesis gives us a story of such a flood. The reason at least that's given in the story, people were wicked. Shame, shame, shame. The reason, because God chose it. And the reason we know about it is because God chose to protect a worthy family. Now, I want to invite you to dive deeper into the minutia and details of this text than sometimes we do. Sometimes we pick up a little nugget of a scripture and we play with that and we move forward. Or we pick up the general message and theme and go forward. But to do that, I think, to really treat this scripture as it deserves to be, we have to use our brains a little harder than sometimes we want to pre-football on a Sunday morning. Unless you were up early analyzing the over-unders on something and then your brains have been going too long. In Jewish history, we see an evolution of thought. Before the exile, in the more ancient writings, they wrote as if all events were from God, the good and the bad. If something good happened to you, you deserved it. If something bad happened to you, you deserved it. If something bad happened to you and you were really, really good, it was either your children or your parents' fault. And we continue to see generations blaming each other still today in good biblical tradition. All you could do really was interpret whose fault it was that God was responding to. But after the exile, after the northern and southern kingdom split, the north falls, and then Babylon conquers the south and moves people into exile. Eventually, the Persian Empire comes and conquers Babylon. While they're in Babylon, they meet people who've been exiled from other places, and they start to intermingle and exchange ideas philosophies, theologies. They meet folks who are Zoroastrians, who have a dualistic understanding of good and evil, God and some other evil power that God fights against. 
And then when the Persians defeat Babylon and send them all back home, they invite them to go back and all of these cultures to pray for the new Persian empire. In other words, they hedge their bets. They put a chip on every spot on the roulette wheel and everyone on the bingo board. They cover all their bets and just ask all these religions to pray for the, for the kingdom instead of picking one and mandating it. It creates a multicultural exchange, an interreligious, an interfaith world that had never been allowed to exist in this part of the world before. And if it did, those, those factions were at war with each other, not in conversation. Things change. It goes to God battling an evil in the world. We eventually personify that in the character of Satan in a lot of scriptures and stories. For some, it becomes more of an entrenchment on why they think people are bad. People are the evil that God's fighting against. It's not really scriptural, but it's there. Either way, there's now room for nuance. There's a gray area in the theology. We're focused on grace as the fundamental relationship with God, not a creator and subservient creation. We're focused on love of neighbor and God as the core concepts of faith embodied in the teachings of Jesus. This becomes the Christian voice and the gospel going forward. So when we go back and revisit a story that was first told thousands of years before paper existed, okay, told before paper existed and then written on ancient forms of paper in the newest of languages and then translated multiple times over, we have to use our brains a little. We have to think about where it came from. When was the story told versus when did it supposedly happen? When was it written down compared to when it was told? How was it passed to us? Who passed it to us and why? Of all the stories to keep, why the ones we have in scripture? I've made the case over the years and we were talking about it this last Thursday night again, that the miracle of the Bible is not that someone closed their eyes and God moved their hand and we got the Bible. The miracle is that generation after generation has been a part of this, that it's a group project that worked out well. When do group projects turn out well? We've all been in that class. We all hate the group project, especially if you're the one that feels like you're doing all the work. It's a group project that worked, and each generation contributes to the group project as we translate it, and we wrestle with it in the context of our world. The Holy Spirit continues to move through stories as we share them with one another, which is the greater miracle, God moving one's hand and us reading it literally, or everybody having a voice and us hearing God speak through it. Our story that we receive in Scripture is the story of Noah, who lived before Abraham, lived before Moses. Our story has God as very sad and very upset about how people treat each other. And as we read it, it sounds like it's been written twice. As we read it, it sounds like it's been written twice. If you have time today, go back and read Genesis 6 and 7 and you will see a repetition of a story that sounds like someone took a deck of cards with the stories on it and shuffled them together, each with their own version. Like Genesis 1 and 2 have different accounts of creation, Genesis 6 and 7 have different accounts of the flood, but rather than put them in two separate chapters back to back, they intermingled the parts. So in Genesis 6, we get this introduction of God's high level of frustration and noticing of Noah. And then it repeats it again, and the second version gives you the names of the family. And then the same thing happens in chapter seven. And you may have noticed, you may have noticed today that the number of animals going on the ark is not what you sang about as a child. It's not what you've seen in the storybooks. Anybody catch on to that and do a little double take as Serena read? How many pairs of animals came on first? Seven, seven pairs of all the clean animals. What? And then two of the rest. And then seven 
of the birds. What? God likes the birds better than the others? What? Some have made the case this is for food. Either way, either way, it's different because right after that, there's a retelling where it's just a pair of all the animals and they all show up. This reflects two traditions writing. If you look through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, those first five books, the Torah, the oldest of the Jewish scriptures, you'll find really four different voices throughout it. The Deuteronistic historian, the historian who writes down all of those laws and puts it all together. But you'll also find these other three traditions. And we hear them clearly in Genesis 1 and 2. One uses the name Elohim for God. It gets translated in your Bible as God, just G-O-D. And then there's the Yahwists. It gets translated the Lord. So when you read God for a few verses, and then it changes to the Lord, it's not that they're just trying to diversify their name for God so you don't get bored. It's two different pieces that kind of get put together. And you can tell whose paper we're reading. One of them was very focused on the order of things, the worship, the structure, the liturgy, the religious nature of the community and how they were bound together. Much like a minister might be concerned about how we do worship practices. The other was worshiping God more spiritually, was more worried about our relationship with God and recognizing God's presence with us. More of a spiritualist, a monk, you might think. There's different perspectives and different images on God, and we hear it coming to us. I warned you we were going to use our brains a little more, right? So why was this story told? When was it told? How was it passed down? Why was it passed down to us? Well, it was clearly written down sometime after Moses got the law. Did you say catch that part? Because at this point, there's no reason for them to know what's clean and unclean. If the law hasn't told them what's clean and unclean, how do we know which animals to, to take seven of? So the story eventually gets written down after the law becomes a part of the community, and we project it back onto this story some. This is one of those ways that we know Moses didn't really write it, because there's things that happen after Moses' time that get projected back into the stories, some political realities, some names of countries. We also know that there has not been written language when it happened. This is going way back before we get the Phoenician alphabet. There might have been some hieroglyphics in Egypt and other places forming communication, but not a language enough to pass on the whole story. So we know it comes from an oral tradition. We know the story is older than the writing. We know the story is older than the writing. Possibly between 2000 and 500 BCE is when it gets written down, closer to the 500 end, probably exile and post-exile. Which brings us to the why. Why tell this story? What is a flood thousands and thousands of years ago have to do with anything the people were going through. Why would they pass it down? Think about what's going on in the 500s BCE. Babylon comes and conquers Jerusalem. The leaders are taken away. Those left see the temple and their city in ruin. And others are taken away, away from their home. They see their holy sites devastated. Leaders and teachers are in exile. And they're forced to face harsh abuse and a fearful future. Then another war sets them free and they're thrust back into community together, trying to find a way forward. We don't know exactly when it got written down in this period, but you can imagine why it was told. Can you imagine the hope? that a grandma telling her grandchildren brought as she told them how God had saved them from the flood. Can you imagine those in exile 
how this story spoke to God bringing humanity back from the edge of oblivion. Can you imagine to those in Jerusalem how the promise of a new day, that God will never let the world be completely destroyed, regardless of how they assigned blame and how they understood God at the time, can you imagine how this story spoke to hope that no matter how bleak it might feel, God's going to do something new. No matter how horrible you think things have gotten, it's never the end with God. The story was probably first told in response to a flood that happened. Where doesn't matter. When doesn't matter. What matters is that in the face of fear and disaster, someone told how God was always with us. Someone told how God will never allow the end to be the end. As we said before, it was probably the role of grandmothers keepers of story, tellers of story and faith, givers of hope. Over time, the stories get written down, and those who are focused on scripture and the priestly order of the faith have their version. Those who are focused on relationship with God have their version. Eventually, they get shuffled together, and we receive the story. Eventually, over time, they get written down, copied, and translated, uploaded, and posted online, eventually coming back to us, and we hear the story again. But why? Why did Grandma want us to know the story? Why did those who came before us want us to hear the story? What do they want us to know? Why did grandma tell it after the flood? Why did she tell it after the exile? And why are we telling it again today? Why did so many write it down? Why did so many value it enough to put it on expensive paper and papyrus? And why are we listening still? Because the end is not the end. And God is always making all things new. So let me tell you a story that has been handed down for thousands of years. Once upon a time, there was a great flood. And sadly, those who lived in the time thought nothing bad would happen to them. Sadly, many saw the gathering storm but did nothing to care for their neighbors or themselves. One who did, one who did listen, one who heard God's warning and took action in the face of the storm, Noah. He even tried to warn others and encourage them to take seriously the problems around them. But they did nothing. So Noah and his family boarded a boat they had made. They saved as many animals as they could along the way. Noah and his floating nonprofit menagerie did all they could to survive and pass on what they had received. And when the storms had passed, they started over. It wasn't easy. If you keep reading in Genesis, the family trauma of Noah and his clan is devastating. It's heartbreaking all they go through, especially right after the flood. Noah's heart is broken. He doesn't function well. There's a heavy burden for the weight they carried. There was a lot of healing still to be done, but there was a rainbow in the sky, a promise that the end was not the end, that God's grace would continue with them. God always making all things new. Many years later, a man named Jesus walked the earth. He talked about the need to love our neighbor and welcome all children. He talked about the poor, the refugees, the foreigners, and the widows. He talked about how we're all called, called to be part of a chosen family in God's love. He spoke up to those in power who would oppress. He spoke out against injustice and challenged people to be accountable for their own actions and their own role. He showed compassion, grace, and love for all people, especially those who were hurting the most, especially those that the community didn't know they were allowed to love. He showed them that the end is never the end, even when everyone thought his story was over. And then he showed them that God is always making all things new. Whether we tell the story of a great flood 
or whether we tell the story of Jesus Christ, we proclaim that in God, the end is never the end. And that God is always, always making all things new. Amen. Thank you.